Hello and welcome to the CPD Group podcast. This podcast is the second part of a three-part series. If you've missed part one, feel free to go back and listen, or carry on listening to dive into some helpful tips about creating classroom courses. We hope you enjoy listening. Let's, let's have a quick chat about the classroom training okay. course. So in your opinion, again, you've been in many classrooms over the years, you know, delivering qualifications through to CPD in very different subject ranges by the sounds of it as well. So what would be your advice in terms of producing and creating a, an engaging quality classroom based course? OK, first advice um, is the same as it, as it was for online is know the learner, know who you're talking to and talk to them, not at them. Um, engagement is something that you can really uh, utilize very well in a classroom so there are various learning methods available to you in a classroom that aren't online um just as as online has the advantage of you know the the learner being able to walk away and come back and all that sort of stuff um online uh, sorry uh, in classroom uh, and in situ learning has a has a huge advantage in that you are there and that passion we were talking about earlier you know that getting your passion and what you understand and what you love about your subject into the teaching is going to be key to what you do key to what you do and um I, a little controversially maybe i think the teaching is almost a performance at times you know you have an audience you have to engage them so you can use things like for instance uh rainbow learning which is is where you use one to teach the next to teach the next within the classroom and they collaborate to, to produce that um don't be afraid to send people off and research and come back that's great they get a break from you drawn in on at the front of the room and they also get to go and get a cup of coffee but give them a task you know and say okay well back here in 20 minutes with the answer to this question give a different questions and they combine to make something within the classroom um allow discussion allow debate if you want to put a quiz out to them and and do and check learning which um we haven't really talked about checking learning but uh, again this is a bit of a bugbear of mine is where you get courses where the learning isn't being checked so somebody can't coast through yeah but in classrooms, you should be doing that all the time. You can check learning, give them a quiz, hand it out, make one person quiz master and, and, and give it to the rooms. I saw a lecture years ago uh, as a critical friend. One of the things that, that university and college lecturers do is they have a critical friend process where somebody would go in and grade them as if there was an offset. And I was a, um, I, I did you know, a fair bit of that over the years. And I remember sitting in this lesson once and watching it. And it was really not the most engaged group of students. And the teacher walked in, um, it was in Effie, and these were students who were doing um, level two. They, they'd gone back after not doing so well at school, didn't fit the school environment, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so it wasn't, was it was a fairly challenging teaching environment. And what he had to teach them, believe it or not, was customer motivation, right? And I, and I just thought, this is going to be great. I'm like, you know, a bit schadenfreude, I'm waiting for the car crash. <laughs> and he walked in and he said, he explained what customer motivation was in very, very clear terms. And he said, so expectations then that you have when you're dealing with customers is a customer service course. Um, the expectations you have will affect the way that you behave. And all the way through, he was carrying this tennis ball and occasionally he was bouncing it, catching it, I think. Interesting thing. And he said, now, why have I got this tennis ball? And the purpose of the, what he was saying was the danger of having too much expectation of what your customer wants and what they believe in. He said, why have I got this tennis ball? And of course, 10 hands go up. And they went, because you're going to throw it out to us and the person who catches it has to answer the next question or it's going to be an icebreaker game. And he went, no, I found it in the car park on the way in and dropped it in the bin. He said, so you see the danger and expectations. And I put one down on his course because that is great teaching. That is great teaching. Yeah. Not only did he take the expectations he was going to, you know, the, 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 the subject of expectations, prove his point there and then on the spot. He told everybody in that room that they behaved in that way. So they took it on board that they were, ex you know, behaving in the way that they should not expect from their customers. Fantastic. That's learning. When you're in a classroom, be innovative. Don't stand at the front lecturing. Be innovative. You know, those kind of things. That's what people remember. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that sounds great, to be honest. I mean, it's contextualizing the learning for people, isn't it? And actually putting it into, you know, a tangible way that they can kind of understand that learning that's being offered to them. I mean, that, that sounds great. Yeah. You know, when, when I look at classroom courses, you know, I've been to many over the years through my career. 
And invariably, there's, you know, PowerPoint presentation and somebody at the front of the classroom delivering what's on screen. Now, that's come in different forms for me, you know, and I've been excited by some and I've been really wondering why I'm looking at certain things. But you get a good one, though, isn't it? Exciting when you when you it observe really a really good yeah, lesson. Somebody yeah. delivering a, a proper presentation using PowerPoint, you know. So in your experience through classroom training, is PowerPoint essential? And if so, how do you use it properly without kind of, as we mentioned before, you know, the whole PowerPoint to death? OK, PowerPoint. Um, it, it's a bugbear of mine, PowerPoint. It is a de facto fault, default position. Everybody goes, oh, I'll just do a PowerPoint. Um, if, you, if, you, if you're teaching in any environment, actually, not online, in classrooms, distance learning, on Zoom, whatever, if you take that approach of I have this default position I think you're making a mistake you, because you've missed a, you've skipped a beat you've gone uh, uh, ahead in the process what you shouldn't be doing is this is how I teach how do I make my teaching go there what you should be saying is this is what I want to teach what will work PowerPoint may not always be the right answer mm. chances are it'll form part of the answer because PowerPoint writes things up nice and big and easy for people to, to absorb, you know. But that's what it's for. It's certainly not for you to just read what's on it, unless you've got a specific reason for that. Um, uh, but what it should be is a support tool. PowerPoint is not there to lead the learning. It's there to support the learning that you're delivering. So um, it should be short. Each screen's three or four points on at the most that you expand on with them. If PowerPoint isn't necessary, don't use it, would be my advice, in, uh, particularly in a classroom environment. There's um, uh, universities which, um, you know, they get a lot of criticism, but they get an awful lot of things right, universities, and they tend to come in three um, uh, formats for a, for a teaching process. They do practicals, which I did for many years. Uh, they do lectures, which I also did for, for many years, where you stand at the front can be a challenge, but usually that's because you're doing a viewing or you've got, you know, you're watching a film or whatever, you need people to go. Or they do seminar, and a seminar is by far and away, for me, the best way of learning that there is in a group. And that requires discussion, it requires exploration of the ideas by the learners, and you lead and facilitate. What you can't do in those circumstances read from PowerPoint, so it might be that you put up a PowerPoint slide that just has one question on, you know what is the importance of blah or how do you measure whatever and then let the learners do the teaching let them teach themselves you know they are um uh, they're engaged you, you'll find it absolute pleasure because you'll meet some absolutely brilliant people as well you get to know them better in a classroom environment the better you know them the better you can teach them so certainly initially i think uh, if you're teaching a series of courses for instance Try and keep away from PowerPoint in the early ones as much as, as possible and let the learners learn e know each other and learn from each other so that what you can do is facilitate the learning, not dictate the learning. And I think if you get in a position where you're dictating the learning off PowerPoint, you need to stand back and have a good long hard look at how well you're teaching there because nobody likes that. No, no, no I certainly don't. No, and I totally understand your point. That makes a lot of sense to me. Now, you know, you say that sometimes it's not critical to have PowerPoint, yeah. things like that. Is there any elements of a classroom course that you would class as critical? Or is it very much dependent on the individual course, the individual tutor? I mean, is there anything specific that you would say is a must within a classroom course? Yes. Yeah, there, there, there's a, a long string of them. Um, go and have a look at the accredited framework and it'll give you, you know, pretty much a good rundown of everything that should be in a classroom. The same way it should be in any training. Um, it... it Horses for courses, if you'll pardon the pun. But the um, the but you know, it, uh, what you you certainly must be doing is checking prior learning prior to uh, the course. See a lot of online courses that assume, um, and again, this crowd, the accredited framework encourages people to do that before they put a course in to check that they're at the right level. Yeah, and that's quite often about prior learning. Um, checking uh, attainment. Is another failing that quite often comes up. Whether you, you know you'll see classroom and online courses in particular suffer from this, and it gets to the end and it goes answer these five questions on an online course, and you think that took two hours. You know, I, you, you you've ticked a box there. I'm sorry, that didn't do anything. So 
Um, a better way to do that is to, at the end of every section of an online course, have a, a quiz. It'll take you 20 minutes to write a quiz that will do this, and they can't progress until they prove learning, you know? Um, you can't always do that. Sometimes you do have to trust the learner. Uh, maybe it's remote and, and things. Obviously, of course you do. But everything you can do to check learning, in classrooms, check learning. There's a reason why people ask questions of the students. It's not to annoy the students. It's to check learning, you know? So you've got to keep that in mind. Um, inclusivity is really important. It's really important. You, you, you know, every student you accidentally alienate through a lack of inclusivity or, a, 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 you know, a little clumsy use of language or whatever is a student that you lost. And that's not what you're there for. You know, you're there to, to teach people. And again, I think bottom line, I'm sorry I keep going back to this, but it's learner first. Mm. You know, in any environment, it is learner first. And if you, um, you get to know who they are. And, and uh, sorry, a little digression on that, if I can. Um, I had, is row the right word, discussion with somebody about this who said, oh, yeah, but online, how do you know who the learner are? And I went, are you, ki you kidding me, right? Uh, this is what happens when you discuss things over a glass of wine. Um, and I'm like, so you're kidding. I said, you, you, you're providing a course, that is, and it was very technical to us he provided. I said, so you know their background? Yeah. I said, well, so are they apprentice level? So yes, I said, so you know their ages, on average? Well, yeah, yeah. I said, so these people are not a university, so we can assume they're not, you know, of, of the university academia route, they've gone this more practical. Yeah, I said, because you're providing a pretty big picture here of who this person is. And you're telling me there's no way knowing who they are. You know, even if you're online, you're remote, you're putting stuff up, you know who's taking that course, you know how they're likely to speak, how they're likely to behave. To some extent, you know, you can then take judgments on, will they have the attention span for a technical subject of in depth this way, or am I better to break it up? The more you know about that person, and yes, we are judging, of course we are, but we're remote. Give me a better option, I'll take it. If telepathy's been invented, bring it on. But it hasn't, you know. Um, and the other thing that, that you might want to think about if, and I appreciate there's sometimes a commercial and a, um, a practical aspect to this, but if you can do that final assessment as a send and return process so you can see, you know, ask them to fill it in and then go back with comments, go back with commentaries. Um, I appreciate that's a bit of extra work online, but there's a reason that universities have been doing that for years. Yeah. You know, it's because you get to actually fully assess whether the learners learned. So, yeah, sorry, I digressed a little bit there, but oh, no, you, you pressed one of my buttons on me. <laughs> yeah, it seems so, but that's good. I mean, this is what this podcast is about, is to share that kind of, you know, that kind of information, that wealth of experience and that, that kind of opinions that you have Absolutely. Built over the years. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to part two of this podcast. We hope you've enjoyed listening. Look out for the next part of this episode coming soon where we discuss blended learning. See you next time.